Okay, we're at the final two stops of the nephron, which are uh, the, f the functional unit of the kidney. And so what I want you to be able to see here is, I just have this little random picture of a kidney, is that these, these nephrons, these loops, these, this is the next part we're going to talk about, this loop of Hanley, they're all kind of dipping into this dark pinkish area, which is called the medulla, okay, outside is the cortex. So all of these little trombone things are overlapping. I think you get the picture, should I keep? Anyways, they're all reaching into here. Um, this was a very complicated thing to understand in full detail uh, when I studied this stuff back in the day. And it took me a while to really understand the big picture, the point. So you're going to see if you do some searches through, I don't know, uh, on, online or college textbooks, you're going to see a lot of complex talk about countercurrent multipliers and things like that. I'm just going to present a very basic version of this, but hopefully to help you understand the big picture of what's actually happening and the purpose of what's happening here so as to facilitate the whole function of the of the kidney. So uh, not a lot to write here, but just let's see if you get the, 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 big, the big picture and uh, perhaps I can do something in more detail for those of you who want to know the exact mechanism. Okay, so this is called the loop of Anle, loop of Anle, L-O-O-P of Anle, capitalize H-E-N-L-E -E with a little accent at the end of the E to make it fancy. Um, the purpose of this whole little trombone loop down here is to make the area around it, make the area around it very salty, okay? Very salty or high in uh, salt and ion concentrations, okay? So the medulla, again, is this dark pink area. And why is that going to be good? We're going to see that in a second. It's going to help to concentrate the urine a little bit, concentrate the urine and reduce some of the, remove some of the water. And it's going to help in the final stage here called the collecting duct, which we'll see on the next screen. So how do we accomplish that? Well, very funnily, these two, the, this is called the descending loop. This is called the ascending loop. Let me start by talking about the ascending loop. So any of the liquid that comes through here, so the glomerular filtrate is coming through. In the, this is the proximal convoluted tubule, which we talked about in the previous video which has reabsorbed a whole bunch of the things that we want to go back into the blood, like amino acids, like glucose, a bunch of the salts, and maybe some of the water uh, already. But the urea is heading down this way, and there's still some water, and there's still some salts coming down here. And so the next step's got to do something. It's like a, uh, a factory line. So this has to have some kind of function. So it turns out that this side of this loop, the ascending loop, is permeable to salt. In other words, ions can pass through, but water cannot. It is impermeable to water. And it, guess what? It's exactly opposite for the descending loop here. The descending loop is permeable to water, but impermeable to sodium. So imagine, try to picture what's happening here, and uh, we'll go through this with actual molecules in the very final video of this uh, series. So. The liquid's coming down here. It contains urea, it contains some salt, and it contains some water. And we want to make sure we don't get rid of too much water. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to concentrate. So what's going to happen is this liquid's going to come down here, and during this part here, uh, there may be some water that can go, that can flow back and forth, okay? Depending on how salty it is around here, because water moves by osmosis. In plain English, this is what I want you to remember, is that water generally moves to saltier areas saltier areas. Water moves, uh, I guess you could say, well, this is what confused me when I was in high school. Water moves down a concentration gradient of free water molecules, but it moves against the concentration gradient of uh, ions and dissolved ions. So just think about water moves to areas that are more salty. That's why I wanted to start here, because the liquid that comes up through here, there's no water moving, but there's plenty of sodium that can move into the area around, okay, into the area outside of the, the loop of Hanley. So what happens is this area around here, which I'll make, uh, let's make it green, is becoming more, oops, that's horrible, is becoming more salty. This area around here is becoming saltier and saltier, and this area around here is getting saltier. And But water can't move out, cannot follow the salt. But so what happens is the water, the liquid, the fluid that's coming down through here, the water actually does leave 
this tubule, leave the loop of Anle and go into the surrounding tissues. So water goes in the surrounding tissues and it can join up uh, back into the capillaries and then flow back into the bloodstream. So the water can go back into the bloodstream. So if it leaves this tubule, it can uh, go into the tissues and actually enter the capillaries of the blood and actually come back um, into our bloodstream as normal. So the purpose is to make the whole area salty. It accomplishes this, accomplishes this by having one area that is permeable to sodium that allows the outside tissues to become more salty. And then at this side right here, the water can get sucked out. Overall, what's happening is by the time the liquid, liquid in point A has reached point B, it has become more concentrated. There's less water in there. But this saltiness outside here is also going to play a role in the next part. So now that the outside area is salty, this green area is salty, let's find out what happens in this final part here. So liquid comes up through. This is our last place for us to really check to see how much water we need to let into our urine. You've all experienced this, right? Dry, uh, hot summer day, uh, very concentrated urine, very yellowish, but if you've been drinking tons and tons of water and you haven't eaten a lot of salty foods, then you produce large volumes of urine that are very clear. So the final step here is what happens in this part called the collecting duct. And in the collecting duct, which we are emphasizing here, the collecting duct is normally, oops, the collecting duct is normally impermeable to water. So once things, once the liquid reaches here, it's just on its way and it's going to collect together and it's going to uh, go to the bladder. Okay, it's going to go to the bladder and be ready to be released as urine. Um, but what happens is we can do a little bit of regulation here and there's a hormone that plays a role and I'll give you the official name and how I would remember it. It's called ADH and it's produced by the hypothalamus but released by the pituitary gland. You can just say secreted by the pituitary gland. Another name is called vasopressin, and officially ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone, which is good to know. If I had to write this down, I would just write ADH all the time. But in my mind, I actually think of it as the anti-dehydration hormone. So this only kicks in when I'm dehydrated to help me save some water, to help me save some water. So oh, let's not uncover that yet. Um, all right. So here's what happens. If I have drank plenty of water and I am perfectly hydrated and I have in fact excess water that I need to get rid of through urination, well, that's fine. The liquid that comes down here, I'm not gonna do anything because water will not come out of these walls because it's impermeable. So I'm just gonna let all that water flow and it's going to turn into urine. And so everything is fine. So in this case, do I need anti-dehydration hormone? No, because my blood is very dilute. There's plenty of water in there. I don't need to save any of that excess water. And so I don't need ADH to kick in. I don't need my anti-dehydration hormone to help me because I'm perfectly hydrated. So if no ADH is secreted, basically nothing happens. Uh, no aquaporins, I'll explain that in a second. And then water just enters the bladder. So it's not too difficult to understand if you think about it in terms of keeping yourself hydrated. What is an aquaporin? An aquaporin sounds, well, think about it. Aqua sounds like water. Porin sounds like a pore. So what ADH does, what ADH does is it actually puts, builds, constructs temporarily these small protein pores that temporarily make the collecting duct actually permeable. So if, I, if there's water going down here, but I don't want it to go into the bladder and I, and I need to save it, then these aquaporins stimulated, the, their production stimulated by the, by the presence of ADH will allow water to come back out into here. Now, how is this, how is this gonna happen and why is it important? Well, if water comes back here, well, it will pretty easily, why? Because this area is really salty because we just talked about how the loop of Hanley made this area very salty. So water, as soon as I put little pores in, water will automatically move into the tissues towards the area that is more salty, okay, by osmosis. And then it can be reabsorbed and then go back into the bloodstream and then make my, put, put all that uh, extra needed water back into the bloodstream, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So what happens if you are kind of dehydrated? You just ate a lot of salty ramen, you haven't drank water for a while, it's really hot and you've been sweating and uh, it's super dry. 
then, well, your blood is a little bit too salty and you can't afford to give up any of that extra water. So any of the, any of the liquid, that, the fluid that comes down through here, we want to try to bring some of it back. So in this case, to help you, be, to prevent you from being dehydrated, the anti-dehydration hormone, ADH, remember it's actually called anti-diuretic hormone. Okay? This is just to help you get, wrap your mind around this. Um, if your blood is really salty and your body detects this, that your water levels are low and sodium levels are very high, well, your pituitary gland will secrete ADH. The ADH will stimulate the production of aquaporins, and these aquaporin proteins will allow the wall to become permeable to water, and water is going to move back, move through, uh, move back into the tissues by osmosis and return to your bloodstream. That's basically it and this part here is primarily what determines the color and volume of your urine so next time you visit the bathroom and do a little number one uh, take a look and ask yourself if your body has recently secreted adh and if you've just temporarily constructed aquaporins or not so go back and check through all of these there'll be one last video after this to help put it all together with a really fantastic animation uh, from a website called Biology Mad. But I'm just going to do a little narration on top of it. But I'll put the link in and then make sure you check all of that stuff out. Woohoo!